All right, looks like we have uh, 1030. Call the meeting to order. And Holly, if you'd please take a roll, and if uh, people could acknowledge uh, being present and also who they're representing on the board. Okay. Wendy Hess. I'm here representing communication centers. Bridget Edson. Mindy Benson. Here representing Iowa Emergency Management Association. Michelle Bischoff. Curtis Woten. President representing volunteer fire departments. David Ness. Here, Municipal pol uh, Police from Des Moines. Daniel Schaefer. Here, representing Municipal Police. Dan Fink. Here, representing Sheriff's Office. Jason Schlutenhofer. Here, representing Iowa Sheriffs. Angela Clouser, she said she might be on. Yes, I am here, representing Panorama Schools, member at large. Okay. Haley Nichols. I'm here, and I'm representing the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy. Cindy Hike. Uh, Peter Huffman. And here, representing the Department of Transportation. Trace Kendig. Heath Hove. Here, uh, representing Iowa Department of Public Safety. Patrick Updike. Present Iowa Department of Corrections. Blake Jerushi. Here, representing Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management Department. Jessica Turba. Here, representing the Iowa Office of the Chief Information Officer. Okay, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Any uh, legislative uh, liaisons on the uh, call today? Okay, well, I appreciate everybody uh, uh, joining us this morning. Without uh, further ado, I'll entertain a motion to approve today's agenda. Second. Heard a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Entertain a motion for a meeting minutes from April 8th. I think we'll make that motion. Second, Huffman. Thank you, Dan and Peter. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Swift report, Mr. Myers. Yes, thank you, Chair Ness. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, my update for the month will be uh, information dense, but hopefully not too long. Uh, I'll start off with a lighter topic. I'm still working on the in-meeting uh, work to try to find a venue that will host us. Uh, I have been told that some agencies are in a relative holding pattern and that uh, some of them may be opening up for uh, general public access, uh, but they may not be available yet for in-person meetings. Uh, given that, uh, we'll continue to work on some contingencies for that, and uh, we will work to try to get uh, back to in-person meetings at some point uh, this summer. That's, that's the goal. Uh, we're also working uh, with some cleanup from the derecho response. Um, I'm happy to report that the East SDR uh, has been fully demobed and the service on that is complete. If you remember, that included some 10-year maintenance on the generator, which was a complete cooling system flush, belts, hoses, and also some replacement of transmission lines on the uh, antenna mast on it. That work has been completed. Uh, and it is on its way back to its staging area in Johnson County. I want to thank uh, Deputy Swick, uh, Chief Walls out of Cedar Rapids Fire for his help with uh, getting the SDR serviced, transporting it, and inspecting the work uh, to make sure that it's up to par. Uh, so a huge uh, bit of thanks go out to uh, Chief Walls for his help with that. The West SDR has had some updates uh, this month as well. 
Uh, most notably, the redundant path was installed. Um, that redundant path that we put into it uh, helps keep it from going into site trunking in case the, the backhaul for it over LTE uh, flakes out a little bit. It has a backup way to get back to the system cores, and that should improve the reliability for it. Uh, that was part of the initial thought of the deployment was to have those two paths in there, but we were finally able to get that done. Uh, the, as a result, the stability does seem to be greatly improved, so it's doing exactly what we hoped it would. Uh, in addition, we have been able to move the West SDR to its new location in Clinton as of Tuesday. Uh, they did some tidying up work on the trailer yesterday to make sure it was fully and properly grounded, uh, and that work uh, was done uh, completely on Wednesday. A huge thanks go out to Joel Bates and his partner Greg uh, for uh, the technical work that had to be done to the trailer to make that work. Uh, Motorola worked uh, pretty closely with City of Clinton as well on some logistics. A huge uh, bit of thank yous uh, go out to ADM as well for allowing us to park it on their facility. And then also um, City of Clinton uh, for providing personnel to assist with the move. Um, moving that trailer was an exercise in, in, in patience and uh, uh, required a lot of technical thought as well. Uh, for the board's benefit, I do have some pictures for you so you can see how things transpired. Uh, a picture here is of where it was stationed previously at Clinton Pool. Uh, this one is uh, of the mast before we uh, pulled it down. Uh, the next picture is uh, the mast uh, down, and you can see Ryan Bogle, and I believe that's Chief Atkinson from Clinton uh, Fire on the roof, uh, making sure that everything is straight before we tip it over. Uh, and then at this point, we have it folded over on top of the trailer. And at this point, we start uh, taking the guy wires off and, and packing it up. Here it is at its new resting place in uh, ADM's facilities. Uh, at this point, uh, they had been working on establishing the grounding connections for the lines going up the side of the ADM stack, or, or the grain silo, rather, uh, so that everything's properly grounded. Uh, here's some work that the tower crew did to properly affix the uh, coaxial lines going up the side of the silo. Uh, and then this is how it was routed. Uh, basically, if you look here at the uh, kind of curved metal thing here, this is a kind of, kind of like an ice bridge and a cable guide. Uh, they ran it along this as well, so it's a nice and clean and tidy installation. Uh, if you're curious as to how thick that cabling actually is, this is how it is compared to my hands. Uh, Really, really thick cable. Uh, the tower crew uh, worked really, really hard to get that up to the top of the facility. And here it is properly grounded uh, for verification purposes as well. Uh, this is where ADM was very, very gracious to us as well in allowing us to have a new ground rod installed so that we could ensure that everything was up to code. And then here is uh, the actual size of the silo that it's on. Uh, it is on top of the lattice structure at the top of the grain silo which is approximately 175 feet uh, above ground level. And if you can't see the antennas really well, uh, I've circled them here for you from a slightly different angle so you can see where they're mounted now. Uh, the range improvement from this installation has been significant um, and it is uh, helping uh, City of Clinton and its agencies get the radio coverage that they need to fully uh, serve their, their city at this point while they continue on uh, with the restoration and, and, and recovery. So the work with the, uh, the SDR to get that move to the new facility in Clinton is complete and everything is functioning as expected, and uh, which is a really, really good thing. If you're curious about some of the bills that, that we've incurred from this uh, deployment and the one in Atkins, uh, those bills have been paid. Uh, they have been also transmitted to HSCMD so that we can start the reimbursement work with FEMA or the State Executive Council, and I will keep everybody updated on that work. Moving on to some other stuff, uh, there are some national uh, joint SAFECOM and National Council of SWIX meetings this week. I've been able to attend several of them. Uh, a lot of it is general information sharing, and if anything pertinent from those meetings arises that, that would be of note to us uh, in Iowa, I will certainly bring that, that to, back to the board next month. Uh, local agency training, continue to work on that. It's a joint venture with board representation and DPS as well. Uh, we delivered a few more over the past month, and most notably yesterday, we were in Humboldt <laughs> County. Uh, we were able to deliver three sessions, uh, two in the afternoon and actually one in the evening for volunteer fire as well. Uh, it made for a fairly uh, late night, but it was worth it. I think everybody enjoyed the training and learned quite a bit from it. 
I will also say that if you want some training for your local, local agencies, uh, let me know and we will get that scheduled for you. Uh, we're also working on a curriculum update for the next round of ISIX regional training. Uh, this would be in person and it would include an update to ISIC standards and kind of be more so focused on not only PSAPs but also ground personnel in a kind of a regional setting. Uh, we're also working on coordinating with the county on a situational training session. Uh, that would be one where we sit down with them and we kind of go over some scenarios uh, that may affect their law and fire and EMS personnel uh, in an interoperable sense and kind of work through the process of how to effectively uh, utilize and navigate the interoperability talk groups and to get the most mileage out of them. So that work is ongoing. Um, moving on to the status board, uh, we did have an unexpected outage last week uh, due to a power failure in uh, the Des Moines area that affected some networking equipment. Uh, notification was sent out to stakeholders of the outage and also the restoration. It took us a few hours to get the uh, services back online, but uh, the the outage was only a few hours or so. Uh, we are still coordinating as well with Minnesota on updates to this program. We're in a bit of a holding pattern as uh, their part of the source code development is finalized. And as that changes, I will let everybody here know as well. Uh, for our local partners, if you haven't uh, gotten access to status board yet, please do so. Uh, it's proving its merits uh, as we go throughout the course of this year, especially with more people using it. I've seen several agencies uh, put planned events in there to, to kind of take care of the coordination with their neighbors, and it's worked out really well. Uh, if you're curious about training, uh, we can do that in person or virtually, and it takes about 30 to 60 minutes to do it virtually, depending on the amount of questions, and we can set that up pretty quickly. Again, status board is available at no cost to the agencies that are using it. Uh, so take advantage of this resource uh, if you can. A couple more updates for you really quickly. Interstate interoperability with Minnesota. Uh, we've kind of updated our pot uh, potential process with them. It's been socialized with stakeholder groups along the northern border, and it looks like it's going to work. Uh, so we're going to tidy that up a little bit. Uh, we're also working on a formalized agreement between the two states. Uh, some of their coordinators and, and myself have worked on some of the verbiage with that and we're running it through some legal review for now just to make sure we're on the right track and everything's going to be agreeable to both states. Quick update on our FOG, EFOG and TICPI as well. We had our kickoff meeting uh, earlier this week with CISA. Uh, it was a very good meeting, kind of got everything outlined on what we would want and what we would need to do. And that work will commence soon and it will involve uh, quite a few uh, stakeholders as well. So be looking for those meeting notices to be sent out, uh, within the next uh, several weeks. That's the update I have, Mr. Chair. I will go ahead and uh, take any questions. Hearing none, uh, Chris, great report. Appreciate the uh, pictures and the uh, cooperation and assistance from uh, uh, Deputy Swick Walzer, as you stated, and the uh, folks in Clinton that were necessary to pull off that uh, significant lift, quite literally. Uh, appreciate all that. Move on to uh, 911 Council Report with Mr. Garushi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just as a reminder, the 911 Council meets prior to ISIX, so if you are interested in any 911 uh, related topics, we do record those and post them on the YouTube page. Uh, just some highlights of what we covered today. Um, the, I think I mentioned in the past that we have worked with um, our call handling vendor uh, to introduce a, a disaster PSAP. So local jurisdictions or PSAPs can request this deployable asset uh, should your PSAP become uninhabitable for whatever reason, primarily disaster related. Uh, the process for that uh, would be for the PSAP to contact local emergency management, local emergency management to contact the state duty officer. Uh, and we would then work with DPS to deploy that uh, asset. It is basically a four person, four seat PSAP that is housed in the DPS mobile command vehicle, um, able to take wireless wireline calls, uh, you know, initially uh, staffed with uh, DPS telecommunicators, uh, but also then uh, local telecommunicators would be able to, to get trained up and uh, take calls themselves. Uh, th this is deployable statewide. It is not dependent on uh, any uh, 
participation in, in, in any of the, the shared service programs that we have. So any county or any PSAP could request this in the state. Uh, any questions on that before I move on? Okay, um, a couple other highlights. Um, one of the, the pro programs that uh, we kind of manage is a consolidation grant. Um, and that's been on the books in Iowa code for three or four years now. And we've actually never had um, a 911 service board uh, take advantage of that uh, today for the first time. Um, we did have an application before the council and it was approved. O-Line PD will be folding in with Fayette County Sheriff's Office. So the total number of PSAPs in Iowa will decrease by one from 113 to 112. Um, if you have any questions on that, uh, feel free to get in touch with me offline and I can uh, answer those. Uh, the last thing is we are finalizing the benchmarks for GIS grants. We offer um, basically incentive grants uh, for geographical information systems, some of the, the, the mapping that goes into NextGen 911 uh, to make sure uh, data is of a high quality to be used within the system. Um, we've done that for a number of years. Um, so we continue to raise those benchmarks to make that data more usable and just all around better. Um, so we are having a webinar on May 20th. If you are involved in addressing or GIS or PSAP management, um, you might be interested in that webinar uh, where we'll talk kind of about next steps for using that data as well as the benchmarks for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, that is all I have. I would take any questions. Appreciate your report, Blake. Thanks. Thank you. User group committee, Chair Schlutenhofer. Yes, uh, the user group met April 15th. Uh, we voted and approved three users, Harris County, which is a level four, City of Osceola, which is a level two, and TIP Rural Electric Cooperative, which is a level two. Um, you'll see that new business, and that's all I have for you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your reports. Finance Committee, Swick Myers. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the closeout activities for SLIG P2 uh, continue. I don't think there's a whole lot to report with the SLIG P activity as it is relatively unchanged from last month as uh, the expenditures would have been minimal. Uh, we are looking at some expenditures though that have been paid. Uh, we had a collective total of $5,273.82 uh, paid over the last month. Of those $4,219.06 were uh, federal expenditures. For the interoperability and broadband uh, communications fund, the expenditures last month were $4,194.36, and that leaves us with approximately $197,067.98 left in that account. Uh, that is the report that uh, I have for the month. I'll go ahead and take any questions. Hearing none, thank you. And we'll move on to governance with Chair Huffman. Uh, the governance committee met and discussed um, an in the works A6 uh, standard, uh, the statewide pursuit communications 1.4.0. Uh, the purpose of that standard is for uh, interoperable guidelines and procedures for pursuit, pursuit communications. Uh, I think the most important thing to note there is that it is not an attempt to dictate how individual agencies do their pursuits. However, when uh, interoperation is necessary, uh, there needs to be some common standard for how they coordinate. And that's what this standard seeks to establish. Um, it is currently in the state where it's ready for public comment. I think that will be the recommendation later on in this meeting. And that is all for the Governance Committee. Thank you. Any questions on that uh, on policy? Certainly uh, we have time while it's uh, going to be pushed out uh, with board approval for uh, public comment. We have an opportunity to review it uh, at the board level as well uh, after that comment comes back. But any questions for Chair Huffman or operations, uh, which is, I believe, where it uh, 
uh, came from. Any questions on the uh, standard as it uh, as it's presented today? Hearing none, we'll move on to operations committee. I believe uh, Chair Bischoff was uh, absent today. I'm not sure if uh, Chief Dennert or someone else can stand in. Yes, Mr. Chair, um, I can uh, step in. This is Chris. Um, operations did meet the last uh, couple of months. Uh, I don't have the agenda in front of me right now, but we did discuss uh, various things relative to the standard that's in front of the group today with respect to pursuits. Also discuss some elements of the sub-regional uh, talk group standards as well uh, and sent those on for further comment uh, amongst the committees. Thank you for the update. Uh, I want to cover outreach committee as well. Sure. Um, the newsletter for last month after the board meeting was sent out approximately a week after uh, the board meeting. Uh, that seems to be a very good cadence. Uh, it helps ensure the information is fresh to stakeholders. Uh, look for that uh, newsletter to go out again sometime midweek next week. Uh, there'll be a whole lot of new information in there. Uh, along with some updates from, I believe, our training chair, uh, Ms. Haley Nichols. So uh, look for that newsletter coming out next week, and uh, that's the outreach report. Thank you. Good uh, uh, mention, introduction. Uh, chair Nichols, anything from the uh, training committee? Yeah, good morning. Uh, we, they met on the 28th of April. I was absent for that meeting, but uh, Swick Myers advised me that they discussed creating the training module for the air to ground air ambulance standard will be next. He'll create the slide deck and then we'll get that recorded. And that is, oh, the Com L virtual sign up is still open and there were only 15 seats available. Um, Swick Myers, maybe you could update on where we're at with sign up. Yeah, uh, we've had uh, a handful of people sign up already, uh, so we still have seats available. Uh, we sent initial notification out to the uh, personnel that submitted an interest in, via survey uh, last month first. Uh, this announcement uh, will go out uh, to a larger scale by the end of this or next week. Uh, the thought process was to give them first crack at it uh, to ensure that uh, they were able to get signed up. Uh, we've also had some interest uh, from attending this course uh, from the National Guard, uh, not necessarily the Iowa National Guard, the U.S. Uh, National Guard, uh, or the Coast Guard, rather. I'm sorry, got my uh, guards confused. Apologize for that. Uh, we have had some interest from the Coast Guard as well. Um, uh, in some conversations with them, I said we could work to accommodate them, uh, but the seats would be reserved for Iowa personnel first, and, and, and they completely understood that. So we do have some interest in this. Um, the one thing that I have fielded some questions on is the availability of ICS 300, which is a prerequisite for this. Um, there are some personnel that uh, had not been able to complete ICS 300 in time for this course's sign up. Uh, a couple of things for that. Make sure you keep in touch with the Homeland Security and Emergency Management uh, Department's uh, training calendar. Uh, those ICS 300 offerings are, are, are listed there. And also uh, check in occasionally with your emergency manager as they may have awareness of those ICS 300 training opportunities as well. The good news, though, is that we will be looking at hosting a state-sponsored one this fall. Uh, so if you can't get in on this course, uh, there'll be another one coming up here uh, shortly after it. Uh, Ms. Nichols, I'll go ahead and pass it back to you. Thank you, sir. I have nothing further unless there's any questions. Thank you both. We'll uh, jump to the technology committee with chair update. Thanks. Um, technology met on April 22nd and May 4th. <clears throat> Unfortunately, with everything going on here, I wasn't able to attend part of the April 22nd and May 4th, and Swick Myers may have to bail me out on some of this, but 
<clears throat> last month after they approved the air-to-ground channel policy, I went ahead and updated the ICS 217A. Um, it hasn't been posted to this website yet, but when it does, you will see V-Law 31 uh, updated with carrier squelch on the receive side, and then your uh, <clears throat> air-to-ground channels listed. <clears throat> Uh, we continue to work on the A6MC12B um, policy. Uh, we still need to vet that out a little bit with some of the other committees. And once that's done, then we'll we'll push it out for a 30-day comment. Um, I wasn't able to make the RPC meeting last month, but um, we are still looking at acquisition of additional 800 conventional channels and um, what modes to use on those channels once they're acquired. So there'll be more about that as we move uh, throughout the year. Um, Chris, you want to kind of follow up on the um, subscriber unit ID discussion as it relates to the uh, conventional channels on the ICS? Yes, sir. Um, so there's a couple of things with that ICS 217A that we can do to add some coherency and additional uh, dexterity to those uh, 700 megahertz conventional interoperable channels. Think your 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 seven tax, your seven call fifty, uh, and also even with our simplex uh, scene of action channels in 700 megahertz, um, those would also do the same thing for us. Uh, we can look at adding a unit ID, which depending on how that's done, uh, it can give some sort of descriptor as to who is actually doing the transmitting. If you think back to things like VLAW 31 uh, and even the 800 megahertz interoperability channels, um, those don't give you necessarily a radio ID, but with the 700 megahertz uh, simplex channels and conventional channels, there is that ability to do that. So if we have that option at our disposal, uh, we may as well kind of figure out a pathway for people to go so that they can designate who they are. So that if someone is looking at a radio on uh, uh, receiving a transmission from someone else, they can tell at least where they're from. We're also looking at some other unique things with respect to um, how the talk group IDs within those conventional channels are done as well. Um, we still have to do some testing on that. Uh, we were coordinating with some federal partners on that. Uh, that testing was not able to get completed in time for the technology committee meeting. So we're going to uh, go through some more work uh, with that to verify functionality and things like that before any documentation is pushed forward. So in some senses, it's no update or change to the status quo. Uh, we've still got a little bit more work to do, but hopefully we'll have that completed relatively soon. Patrick, I'll pass it back thanks. to you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for doing that. That's all I have. All right, thank you for the report. Um, first, uh, first net broadband committee. Uh, Chair Bischoff was unable to join today. Uh, Chris, do you have a report on that, or should we wait till next month? Uh, Chair Ness, I would wait until next month because I was not able to make that meeting either because uh, that was the day we moved the SDR in Clinton. Okay, and I think we'll find out later in the agenda that the uh, FirstNet Authority uh, rep is unable to be here as well today. Uh, but we can uh, jump ahead then to agenda item 16, information sharing amongst board members. Anything board members would wish to discuss? Yes, Chair, this is Mindy from uh, Blackhawk County and representing emergency managers. Uh, myself, and Chad Hahn from National Weather Service, as well as uh, Swick Myers, have been working on a pilot program with the National Weather Service and the National Weather Service uh, channels within the ISIC uh, talk groups to do um, some communications with, I believe it's, um, Chris, you might have to help me with this, is it eight counties or six counties um, across the Des Moines Weather Service area or Des Moines National Weather Service area to be able to communicate a little bit faster if we have, um, whether it be disaster information we need to share back to them, whether it be damages or they need to share information with us in a quick and timely manner 
on the storms that are moving through. This is kind of something that we talked about last year after, after the derecho on getting information out quickly to counties that need to be notified of whether a weather events coming through or getting damage reports back to them. So we're gonna try that this year to see how this is gonna go, what things, what irons we need to get worked out, what bugs we need to get worked out. So that way we can roll this out across the Des Moines Weather Service. And we're also gonna do this across all of the weather service areas within the state of Iowa. But we wanted to get this in a smaller core concentrated group. So that way we have things a little bit more streamlined before we get it rolled out to the entire state. Yeah, uh, Mindy, if I may add, uh, the concept here is to take uh, kind of that I idealized local radio network that's been around the greater Des Moines metro area now since I believe uh, right around 2000 and kind of take that same concept where an agency had, could have radio communications with the Weather Service for uh, pertinent uh, exchanges of information and grow that to areas of the state where they don't necessarily have that because as Mindy alluded to, after things like the derecho, uh, traditional methods of communication with the weather service were not available. And given ISIC's uh, stature and coverage footprint in the state, this would be a great way to expand uh, concept and theory of operations uh, out to local agencies that didn't previously have that functionality. Captain S, so you can go ahead and uh, take it from there. I think that's the uh, bulk of the information sharing on the uh, Weather Service Talk Group uh, pilot project. Chris, I believe I see where he got disconnected, so he may not be on. Oh, uh, Peter, would you be able to uh, carry on the meeting from here until uh, Chair Ness can get reconnected? Yeah, I think so. We had just finished with FirstNet. We had just uh, broken into information information sharing among board members. So the next uh, item of business would be Motorola Project Manager uh, update. Okay, well, let's move into that. Do we have the Motorola Project Manager handy? Perhaps not. Um, if they're not around, uh, if Scott Richardson could jump on and talk about the uh, System Administrator Report. Yes, I'm here. Um, this should be fairly brief. <clears throat> I'll start off with some system maintenance. Um, we've had a tower light or a tower beacon replaced on the Monona Tower this week, which uh, helped to resolve some tower light alarms we were getting from that site. Also, a tower crew will be on site at the Woodward Tower tomorrow to work on some Dallas County paging equipment. And Motorola has been working an issue with the uh, Adair North to Adair South microwave link, and they should have something to report for us, uh, to us, next week. Um, as far as new numbers, we added 239 new radios this month, bringing the total on Essex to 22,809. There were 2,052,493 push-to-talks for the month of March which is actually 28,156 less than February. And so far in May, we've had 851,620 push to talks. Um, that is all I had. And any questions, I will be happy to answer. Okay, if there are no questions, we can move on to the AT&T FirstNet update. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. A um, few updates here. So just last month, we had six towers go live for FirstNet, um, all in southwestern Iowa. Um, so the cities were as follows, Corridon, Villisca, Emerson, Corning, Diagonal, and Mount Air. Um, so it's a pretty pretty busy month for us, uh, but that's the update I have for you guys as far as towers go for FirstNet.
All right. Hey, Pete. And, uh, what's that? Peter, this is Dave. Okay. Oh, uh, if you've got it, we are you needing to get to the first net authority update. Yep, sounds good. And I did uh, receive a word from Kevin Nida that he was unable to join uh, this month. So we'll move uh, directly on to SZA ECD update from Jim Lundstedt if he's on. Good morning, sir. Is the audio okay? Very good. Thank you. I will make this brief. I want to highlight four quick topic areas this month. Uh, CISA Interoperable Communications Technical Assistance, which Swick Myers has reported on, is currently looking to resume in-person instruction. We are working through a process to get uh, permission to resume that. We believe that will happen in the August or September timeframe right now, but the uh, process is being worked and we recognize that the limitations of very difficult and lengthy in-person instruction has been a barrier to getting some of our programs delivered. So we'll be working with the SWICs and business managers to get that underway soon. Second, our venerable National Interoperable Field Operations Guide, or NIFOG, the new version 2.0 is ready to release to the SWICs and members of the SAFECOM advisory group. We anticipate that being sent to them for a final look in the end of week or early next week timeframe. Version 2.0 will be a complete rewrite replacing the older copies. It is slightly larger than the previous book by about one inch, but includes a lot more current detail than the oft updated version 1.6.1 that is in production today. Printed copies will be made available. We're going to run a print run with uh, our federal partner to get that done probably July, August timeframe for release on that. We will also be updating the electronic version of the NIFOG in advance of the print run, but we anticipate bringing that to delivery uh, late summer at the very latest. Uh, Final thing that I want to highlight first is a recurring reminder about ransomware. And I know this becomes a tired old topic, but with recent news of the impact on the Colonial Pipeline, uh, Washington, D.C., Metropolitan Police, and others in the news in public, I wanted to uh, remind you that this is an increasing area of demand for bad actors and public safety and public service agencies are particularly vulnerable. I'm going to highlight a case and emphasize the need for readiness based on an incident that I was brought into late last week with a major urban area in CISA Region 6, a community of about 1 million people with an IT uh, unit with some 400 servers, both physical and virtual, were impacted by ransomware. The actor had been in their network for a period of time and began impacting their domain name service, their DNS server, ability to route traffic. Uh, this actually crept throughout the network and got into the records area for public safety and impacted CAD, basically forcing a major community's PSAP to fall back to the old way of doing things, basically paper and T cards. And as much as I hate to remind people that that's how we used to get work done, it is something that we would recommend be part of your planning. What are you going to do in the instant case when you fail over before you can turn uh, work over to a buddy location? And just to give you a, a scoping uh, idea of how impactful this is, CISA reminds folks that or agencies that uh, if you store your data offline, you will be fine. But imagine the um, uh, amount of data and equipment that is impacted in an IT organization such as the one I described. So uh, from a public safety dispatch standpoint, we should be constantly thinking about our PACE plan, primary, alternate, contingent, and worst case, the emergency situation that I just described where we would fail back to paper and card system if required. 
uh, believe that is it. Uh, Chris has uh, described our work on the tick fog and supporting the communications unit leader uh, training and look forward to uh, supporting additional work as we resume more normal operations. Are there any questions for me, please? Great update, Jim. Thanks, uh, as always, for your participation. Uh, Standards Working Group, Swick Myers. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Standards Working Group met last month. Uh, the topic material was on the pursuit standard update in taking some feedback from operations and other stakeholders. Uh, as uh, Governance Chair Huffman alluded to before, every effort was made to say that, you know, it's not an overarching order to say that this is how you need to run pursuits more so uh, try to direct uh, communications coordination to using a statewide tax some way somehow in some form uh, the previous update of the standards said that you basically should always patch your ops talk groups or channels into the statewide tack if, if you're the agency that began the pursuit uh, some of the updates include uh, feedback from agencies that say they would just rather continue on changing directly to those statewide tax as opposed to having to do a patch. So that language has been added in there. There's still room in that standard that says you can do a patch uh, for uh, that pursuit into that statewide TAC. Again, the main goal is just to end up on that statewide TAC to make communications during that pursuit a lot easier. Uh, there's also been some elements added for notification of adjoining regions. Uh, there are some agencies that have a single uh, control station access to ISIX and, and that being the only way they can access. And it establishes some processes for notification of neighboring regions of a pursuit that may be coming in. Uh, as an example, let's say a pursuit starts along Highway 92, which is in the northern sections of Region 5. And then that pursuit starts heading north into Region 6 or Region 1. Uh, what would that notification process look like? So that updated standard uh, works to take that into account. And it also adds some uh, mentions of status board in there as well to try to bring uh, that part of that standard up to current practice uh, with some technology that we have available to us. Um, we did take in a lot of feedback, but standards and governance both recognize that this is probably going to be one that's going to be best served to potentially be put out for public comment. Uh, comment period has yet to be determined, but uh, it would probably be beneficial to show people what the finished work product looks like and then uh, seek additional uh, feedback from there. So next month we'll be looking at uh, some, some regional uh, talk group uh, stuff uh, along with some potential outstanding standards uh, dealing with uh, data. That's the report from standards. Mr. Chair, I'll go ahead and take questions. Hearing none, we'll move on to uh, old business. And uh, Michelle is uh, not present to discuss the uh, subregion talk groups, uh, unless anyone else uh, wished to do so. We'll wait till next month for that. And uh, checking with uh, Chair Update whether there's a uh, update on the LTE deployable policy. Yeah, we've, we've made it past the 60-day uh, comment period, and uh, I don't believe there's been any comments made on that. Uh, we were going to, I believe, put it out for 30-day comments. Or, no, I apologize. We were going to make a motion to approve that. But because that document wasn't posted to the agenda, we're going to push it out another 30 days. So... No action. Sounds reasonable. Thank you. Thanks. New business, uh, Chair Slutenhofer, with your Essex approval recommendation. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, bring forward uh, three uh, users for approval for the Essex board. Um, the load system testing has been done by the builder. They have all been approved. With that, I make the motion that we accept Harris County level four, Osceola, P city of Osceola level two, and TIP rural electric cooperative at level two. I'll entertain a second and then uh, any discussion if there is any. Thank you. Move a second. All right, I heard a second from Fink or Walton. Uh, 
Any further discussion on the uh, three approvals? Hearing none, all, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. ISIC's uh, standard 1.4.0, Chair Huffman. Okay, as was uh, mentioned earlier, this is for the statewide interoperable pursuits, and I accidentally just closed it. Um, the current recommendation is that it go out for public comment for uh, maybe 45 days, but we're glad to take some some comments on on what that should be. Um, it's a it's a bit long to go through line by line at the moment, uh, but it, in essence, it says although everybody or at least all the agencies have their own little um, you know, their own ways of doing things in terms of pursuits when interoperating, uh, it would be good to have some some con common operating procedure. And this just gives guidance toward that. Yeah, from my perspective, uh, uh, your comments and uh, and Swick Myers both uh, referenced. Uh, there are agencies that uh, do things or uh, wish to and have operational needs to do things slightly different when it comes to pursuits, and and I think you uh, uh, or the committees have well uh, allowed for that to continue going forward with the only insistence uh, that it somehow be broadcast on the statewide so that other emergency responders and their comm centers uh, are aware of the uh, pursuit that may be impacting uh, their jurisdiction. So uh, from my perspective, uh, you thread the needle here very well. Um, I thought it was going to be uh, more uh, controversial, but the way that it allows for flexible and allows for different uh, solutions. Um, from my perspective, unless we hear other comments uh, to the contrary, which is exactly why you're suggesting that it go out to public comment, um, I'm very pleased with it in its uh, current state. Any other uh, uh, comments as it stands today? Hearing none, I'd uh, entertain a motion to publish it for 40 days, as uh, Mr. Huffman uh, uh, suggested. Peter, are you making that uh, motion? Offer. Second. All right, we had a, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed. All right, thank you. Uh, public comment. Anyone else on the uh, call that would like to uh, address the board? All right, well, appreciate everybody's uh, uh, continuing efforts throughout the month and their reports today in the uh, board meeting. Consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.